Thank you, Sheila. And for those of you that didn't know, that was not Keith Duncan. Oh. Anybody ever been uh, uh, close to throwing in the towel? You know, you pray for somebody, uh, maybe it was a loved one or a friend, and, and, and I'm talking about you, you prayed. You prayed every day, every night you were on your hands and knees. You cried out to God. You asked for them to either be healed or be transformed or whatever it is. And, and, and then you, after days upon days and weeks and months and years, You've seen no evidence of change. And, and you just want to throw in the towel and give up. Or maybe it's your marriage that you've struggled for years and you've been to counseling, you've been to all the seminars you could find, you've even been to some of the support groups for marriage, you've read every book you could could ever imagine and, and, and you've cried out to God to heal your marriage and yet nothing has changed. Or maybe it's an addiction or a dream that you had or, or your health. I mean, you know, you know how it is when you get older. It seems like you get one thing well and another thing pops up. But you just, God, come on, get me, you know, get me back to normal. I, I, I may be 60 now, but I want to, I want to be 20 again. And, and come on, Lord, can you not? But, you know, you've prayed and prayed and you just can't do it. Or, or maybe it's your children, you know. Now, I'm not saying you want to throw in your children or throw them away, but... <laughs> But maybe one of your children has kind of wandered away. They're still in the college years, and you've prayed. God, bring them back. You know, they, they know you. They, they know that's in there, and yet you just haven't seen any movement. Well, for all of us who've wanted to throw in the towel, to give up, this morning, you need to hear our word for the day. It's perseverance. It's moving forward. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the studies, I, uh, 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 something I watched this week, showed me, uh, uh, talked about a book by Angela Duckworth. And, and the title of the book is Grit. And, and she, she did extensive research, like at uh, West Point was one of the, the the uh, avenues are there. She went to inner city schools and, and she studied all of these students and people and, and she asked the question, uh, what, you know, what makes some succeed and some not succeed? Now, some of us would say, hey, it's their IQ or it's their family environment or, or maybe it's their economic background or, or their personality. But she says, no, none of those play in what it is. It is their IQ that matters. Their adversity, quotia. She actually goes on to say that grit is a passion of perseverance for long-term goals. It's the ability to move forward when things get tough. When you are at the edge of ready to throw in the towel, it is those moments that you are able to move forward. See, perseverance to me is the difference between throwing in the towel or taking that towel and wiping the sweat off your brow and continuing to move forward. But you know, there's a couple of enemies to perseverance. And, and if you want to, you can take out your outline and kind of follow along here. And it, the first is limited perspective. You know, it's when promises seem impossible. It, 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 it's what keeps you from reaching your goal and, and moving. Abraham and Sarah are the perfect example. Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 12. Remember, God comes and calls Abraham and says, Hey, Abraham, I, I want you to come follow me. And, and, and I tell you what I'll do. I'll make you great. And, and I will bless you so you can be a blessing to others. And, and I know you're 75 years old and, and you and Sarah have no children. But you know what? I, I'm going to give you children. 
and, and your offspring will be more than all the sands of the desert. Now, he's 75 years old. Did I say that, 75 years old? That would scare me to death. Well, I don't know about you. But Abraham leaves his family behind, and he goes and follows God in hopes and dreams of that promise. Now, for 15 years, Abraham followed faithfully. But then at 90, Abraham's perspective got a little limited. He was kind of like, well, you know, God's promised a child, but nothing's happened. And, and what are we going to do? We, we just can't, I, I can't understand this. So Abraham does like so many of us, he takes matters into his own hands. Of course, Sarah was not completely innocent here. She helped with this idea. And Abraham took a slave girl and had a child with him, with her. And we have paid the price for that ever since. Just watch the news and all the problems in the Middle East. It's that per perspective. What we do is we start searching for something and we want God to act in our life and we want God to act not on God's timetable but on our timetable. What we've got to remember is God, and I, I read this this week, it, it says God is the only one who can speak in the past tense of a present reality. Did you hear what he said to Abraham? Abraham, I know you're 75 years old, and guess what? You are going to have a child, and you are going to be a blessing to all the world. And through that child, that blessing is going to go out. See, God is telling it in that moment, in that time, before it happens, what will happen in the future. But Abraham, like so many of us, limited his perspective and started looking in the wrong way. But you also see it in another enemy. It is the progress is not always obvious. You know, sometimes we pray for somebody and, you know, I, I don't know if y'all know this, so I'm not trying to be a spoiler, but season four of The Chosen is now on Amazon Prime. I just found that out last week. Maybe I'm slow and y'all are faster than I am. So I watched it all, the rest of it, this week. And, and it, something struck me during each episode. Is I almost picked up on a frustration of Jesus towards the disciples. And, and I started thinking about this. Hey, hey, this is the end of his ministry. And it was, it was almost a frustration of, they're not getting it. And, and what have I done wrong, Lord? You know, these are the ones you promised are going to lead this ministry after I go. And, and they don't get it. And, and I struggle with that. So this week I started looking and, and thought, well, maybe that's just uh, Hollywood's uh, take on it. But if you read the Bible, you see that Jesus says in Matthew 15, are you still without understanding? In Mark, he says to his disciples, do you not yet understand? And then in John 13, he says, you do not know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand, hopefully, you, you hear it when he hears them as they're walking into the Last Supper. The night he's going to be arrested. And what are they arguing about? Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to have the best seat in the kingdom to come? Even when his feet are anointed in Bethany, the disciples complain because they've wasted money on Jesus they just don't get it. But you know what it is? Jesus could not see the progress that was happening. How many times in our lives do we do the same thing? We don't see the small steps that our spouse that we've been praying for has made or, or the little advances in our marriage or 
the child who now will at least say it's my faith instead of your faith where for years that's all you heard. It's those little moments and when we lose sight of that progress and we don't trust that God has things in store, then perseverance becomes hard. So this morning I want us to turn to an expert on perseverance, the writer of Hebrews. And and I think he lays out a path for us to follow, to overcome, to to persevere. So if you will turn with me to the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, we will read together the first three verses of that chapter. Beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart, so that you may continue to persevere. See, the first thing we need to remember is remember why you started. Listen to that. Since we have been, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. When when you are tempted to stop, when you are ready to throw in the towel and to give up. Turn to Hebrews 11 and read the stories of the heroes of faith. Read the story of Abraham and Sarah who, yes, they made a mistake, but they continued on and then God finally stepped in and they were blessed with their child. Read the story of Moses who stammered and stuttered and yet he went back to Pharaoh and stood face to face and called him to let his people go and then led that whining group of people on a 40 day, oh, it should have only been 40 days, but it took them 40 years to make the journey that we all could have made a lot quicker and yet he still held on to his faith. Or read about David who had wandering eyes and constantly ran for his life from Saul. Or read all the others who have gone before us and those that are around us who did not receive the fullness of God's vision, but they continued to move forward. And remember Jesus Remember, I talked about him being frustrated. But listen to his prayer. If it's possible, Lord, take this cup from me. But not thy will, my will, but thy will be done. And now, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. It's all of those who have gone before us, not only these heroes of faith, but remember those who have sat in the pews beside you over the years, who have been there, who have witnessed to you, who have walked with you, who have strength. You know, the truth of it is, when you surround your people, yourself by people, you become like those people you surround yourselves with. You know, that's the gift that Nick Saban had. Everybody will talk about he was a great coach and all this. No, he was a great motivator of people. He could take the best high school athletes and bring them in, and he could convince them that, hey, if you want to really be good, you've got to continue to work hard, and you've got to outwork everybody else. And guess what? I'm going to bring in another guy that's just as good as you are, and you're going to compete every day with him, and that's going to make you better. Our world today says, no, 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 we don't do that. I'm going to go somewhere where I can just lay back and not have to put anything into it. I'm just going to get by. 
But what separates it is those that allow iron to sharpen iron those that walk with those who are heroes of faith and draw from that, guess what? One day we will become those heroes of faith. So remember why you have started. But then the second step to remember is let go of what's holding you back. Listen to the second part of of verse 1. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Have you ever heard the name Eric uh, Weinmeyer? Eric was the first blind man to ever climb Mount Everest. Do I need to say that again? The first blind man to ever climb Mount Everest. As a matter of fact, he had been blind since he was 13, but it had never held him back a gifted athlete and was able to accomplish all kinds of things. But, but here, this young man that, that, that couldn't see but had, had, had climbed the heights of Mount Everest struggled with one thing. His wife, Ellie, told his biggest obstacle after he had completed the, the climbing of Mount Everest. He, she said, the biggest obstacle he has, the biggest thing in life are the small things in life. She said, you know, now that we have a little girl, she leaves toys in the house and on the floor around the house. So he sometimes struggles as he walks through the house because there are all these little toys. Can you see the headlines now? Blind man, first man to ever climb Mount Everest, breaks his leg in his living room when he trips over his child's pacifier. But she said it's those small things that she leaves on the, to- on the floor that trip him up continuously. You know, what are the small things that hold us back? What are those little things in our lives that separate us from being the person God called us to be? Maybe it's resentment. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's envy, bitterness, stress, anxiety. It may even be a sin that we hold on to. And, and you know, sometimes we only look for the big sins. But what about gossip or, or those sites that we visit in the middle of the night on the Internet? Or maybe it's just the thoughts that pass through our mind. You know, one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves regarding a habit or a facet of our lifestyle is does it help us or does it hinder us from being the person that Jesus called us to be? But did you hear it? The writer of Hebrews also says to run light. So that means we need to look at ourselves and, and kind of do a weight test to, to see what things we need to lay aside. So, so here's four steps for a weight test. One is, does it build me up spiritually? Is what you're doing or what I'm watching or, or what I'm listening to increase and enhance my relationship with the Lord? Does it bring me closer to God or does it send me away from God? Number two is, does it bring me under its power? Do you have a habit that controls you? You know, it may just be food. It may be alcohol, tobacco, television. It may even be that little thing you carry with you everywhere you go. You call it a cell phone and you can't quit looking at it. What are those things that have power over you? Three is, does it burden your conscience? If, if, if you're doing something or, or watching something or, or 
or something's going on in your life and, and you feel guilty, you probably ought to let it go. Or, or you're doing something that you know that it doesn't honor God. Maybe you can lay it aside. And then four, what about something that you've done or you do that would block someone else from seeing Jesus in you? What's the habit that you hide that could be a stumbling block for someone else? You know, that's the weight test. And if it's weighing you down, Jesus calls us to run the race light, to set aside those things that are weighing us down. And then finally, focus on Jesus. Listen to what he, the writer says, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. You know, anytime you're running a race or, or doing, focus is important. It's looking at the goal. It, you know, and I was trying to think, I, I wasn't happy with the way I described it in early service. So y'all forgive me. Those of you that uh, shoot a, a bow and arrow will understand this. So Mac, you'll at least get it. Uh, on, on my compound bow, there's a thing on the string. It's called a peak sight. And it's about that big around. And it fits into the string. So when you take your compound and you're looking down range at a target and you pull your string back with your arrow in, it's where your eye sees only through that peak sight. And basically it blocks, it doesn't really, but it kind of blocks everything else out. So you only see the target or you only see the deer, and, and you can focus on that. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us. When we are running the race, we are to focus on what is ahead of us, to look away from everything else, that our eyes should be focused completely in on what we are looking ahead to, the goal that we have set, the race that we are running. I read a story this week, Roger Bannister. Uh, anybody know Roger Bannister? He was the first man to run under a four-minute mile. He uh, just happened to be in a race after he had run the sub-four-minute mile, and he was getting beat. There was an Australian that was out in front of him, and they were coming into the last lap, the last turn of the last lap, and, and Roger Bannister sort of broke out to make his move while the Australian was still in front, and he was still leading but the Australian made one fatal mistake. Instead of looking at the finish line, he looked back over his left shoulder trying to find where Roger Bannister was. And when he was looking over his left shoulder, Roger Bannister passed him on the right side and won the race. See, how many times do we do that same thing? Jesus is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus has come to clear the path. He has opened the door. He has laid everything out and the yellow brick road leads not to the Wizard of Oz, but it leads to the kingdom of God. And he has cleared that path so that we can follow it. Let us therefore keep our eyes fixed upon him, whatever we do and wherever we are. Corey Ten and Boone actually says, look within and be depressed. Look without and be distressed. Look at Jesus and be at rest. We are to look to Jesus. He is the one. He perfected and pioneered our faith. He has there set the course for us to run, and He has opened the door so that we can finish that race in faith. So here's our big idea for the week keep moving forward towards your victory. You know, baseball, Little League baseball is a big thing, it, it, wherever you are. And I read a story about a, a little baseball team in Pennsylvania that actually was going to win the league 
tournament, and there was one little boy on the team who had, had not even got a bat all year long, but when it came time for the championship game, this was such a big game. His mom and dad had invited everybody in the family. I'm talking grandparents. I'm talking aunts and uncles. I'm talking second, first, second, and third cousins. Everybody within, within 100 miles were there. You know, all 50 of them were standing in the sand, and they were there to cheer for this little boy who was going to probably sit on the bench the whole game. But it just so happened that in the bottom of the last inning, with a runner on third, this little boy came to bat. He walked out as confident as he could, but you can imagine the anxiety. And he stood there to step into the box and he took one deep breath and probably said, oh Lord, help me, and just see the ball. And, and he got in the bat and he, he did as his father, daddy had taught him, stared down the pitcher and the pitcher reared back and threw. He didn't expect the pitch to come so fast and it, whew, by him into the catcher's mid and the umpire said, strike one. The little boy said, I'm gonna be ready this time. So he stepped a little bit harder and got into there and was in the thing and the pitcher reared back and as soon as the pitcher released the ball, the little boy closed his eyes and swung as hard as he could. The ball was in the dirt, but it was strike two because he had hit nothing but air. So now the pressure is really on. Two strikes, runner on third, he steps up and he just, he, he's determined now. He st stares the pitcher down and he is so focused on the pitcher, he never even sees the pitch that whizzed by him and the umpire screamed, strike three, you're out. The little boy started back towards the dugout and you could see it. You could see it not in his eyes, but you could see it in his slumped shoulders. As he walked through the dugout, everyone in the dugout gave him the silent treatment. So he went and took his place alone on the end of the bench. As all the other kids filed out of the dugout, this little boy finally couldn't take it anymore. And he just cupped his head in his hands and began to cry. As the tears are rolling down his face, he hears a voice, a familiar voice, and the voice says, Hey, son, the game's not over yet. And the little boy looks up, and through the tears, he can see it. His whole family has taken the field. Even his grandmother is on second base, and she's ready. And his dad's on the pitcher's mound and says, Come on, son. Let's go, you've got another at bat. The little boy steps in and his dad throws the pitch and he hits it like he's never hit one before. And it rolled all the way to the fence. He starts to run towards first and he realizes he can get to second easily. So he heads towards second. And then in amazement, he noticed that his cousin fumbles the ball. His adult cousin's having trouble picking the ball up. So he starts towards third. And as he rounds third, he hears his mother scream, go home, son. And that's when he notices his dad standing at home plate with his arms wide open, ready to welcome his son home. The Hebrew the writer of Hebrews has it right. Let us run the race that is set before us with perseverance. Laying aside all that holds us back and the sin that clings so closely. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who is standing at home with his arms wide open, ready to welcome us in for the victory that he has set before us. This morning, you may have walked through the door with your towel in your hand. You may have been ready to throw it in. I don't know. 
But Jesus knows. And, and I pray that these words spoke to you. But I also pray that you'll come and you'll give him thanks for what he has done for you. And, and maybe you have been sitting on the edge all of these years. And you've never gotten up to bat. And maybe Jesus is calling you into the game. Because he's inviting you. He's been inviting you for years. And he's ready for you to take your place so that he can stand at home and welcome you home. As Ronnie comes and leads us in our closing hymn, I remind you this altar is open to anyone as we stand together and sing. Hymn 670.